Okay, hey everyone. Um, and in lieu of our lecture yesterday on Monday, um, I'm going to record a quick video with some concepts that are really important for you um, to use in assignment one. Now the assignment one live stream just wrapped up a, about 30 minutes to an hour ago. Um, really, really recommend if you haven't seen that yet that you start there with the assignment live stream, uh, but definitely make sure you watch it. So in this short video, um, we're going to cover an important concept, not only important for the course, uh, but important for assignment one. So really this is sort of a, a crash course in some of the concepts that you need to be um, productive in assignment one. Um, we're just gonna get straight into it. So the title of the video is Arrays of Structs. The cool thing about this video, and something that's gonna start happening a bit more often is that it's not a new concept, it's the merging um, of a couple of different concepts that we've already covered. Okay, one of those concepts is structs. To remind you, um, structs allow us to store groups of data. Um, we can define what a struct looks like. For example, a UNSW student. What information may a UNSW student have? Well, they might have a name, a WAM, a degree code, um, all things like this, a ZID, right? So we can group up different types of information about a student and define a struct that stores that information. Um, and we can use the dot operator to access the individual fields and data types once we initialize a struct. So let's jump to our code here and look at a little, let me make the screen a bit clearer. How's that looking? Let's look at some code that you know, sort of does everything we need to do with a, a simple struct example of a coordinate. Coordinates are actually a really common struct because we want to uh, associate the X and Y position, right, of a particular coordinate. But let's run through this code line by line, then we'll run it and tweak it maybe a little bit. So first thing we always do is we include standard IO.h because we want to do some printing. Then let's have a look at this. We have the struct definition. Now the struct definition it exists outside of the main function, outside of any function. Why is this? Because the struct coordinate that we're defining here needs to be available to main or any other function that we create um, that needs to know what a struct is. So structs and enums and things like that are defined outside of the functions in the global space of our programs. You can think of it that way. All right, the final component is the main function. Now you should be very familiar with the main function by now. Quick recap, this is where our programs will start running line by line. Now, something worth noting. Yes, the program starts running at line 11, but before, during the compilation process, before you run the program, the C compiler has to be aware that there's this struct coordinate here and things like that. So that happens first, okay. So we start our main function. What's this program doing? What's going on? Well, we've got some handy um, comments here to help describe what's happening. Line 11, line 12, we're initializing the struct. Now, we define the struct here. Notice there's no values. We're just describing sort of what the struct looks like. This camera is doing some funky tracking. Um, we define what the struct looks like here. Over here, we're initializing it. We're creating an actual struct in memory. Now this is shorthand and what this means is saying, hey, put the integer one into X and the integer two into Y. It sort of just does it in order. But um, what if we want to read a particular X and Y value, right? From our struct, well, we can do it just like this. Here, we're just printing it. And what this is doing, it's, it's a printf statement and we're saying, okay, print the string. So this is the, the shape of the string that'll be printed the letter X, a colon, a space. Now that shouldn't be um, percent I, that should be percent D, right? For decimal integer. Some versions of C allow both, but that's okay. So we present, are we printing a decimal integer followed by a new line? And then what's the value that we're printing? Well, it's point because that's the name of our struct, dot X, right? The X integer. We do the exact same thing for Y and that's pretty straightforward. So this will print out one, this will print out two. Okay, how do we change one of the values? Well, that's really easy too. We just use the exact same specification, point.x equals 10. It's going to override that one 
and assign it the value 10. And then we're just printing out the values again, exactly the same way as here, just to prove that it all works. All right, let's compile this program. DCC structs underscore recap dot C out to program. That works, we then run that program executable and we get four lines being printed. First, x is one, that makes sense because x was initialized here. Y is two, that also makes sense, right? We set it initially to be two and we printed out the y here. Then we changed x to be 10 and we get x um, 10 and two printed out. So that's a really quick recap into structs. Something else um, worth mentioning actually, if you remember last week we introduced functions. Functions are awesome. Functions allow us to do things with um, blocks of code, to create reusable blocks of code. Here we actually have an opportunity. Why don't we create, rather than having these two printfs here, right? And we notice that when we had a problem with them, I had to fix it every single time. That's really annoying. Why don't we create a procedure um, that can print a coordinate that's passed in. So we create a procedure. Why are we creating a procedure? Well, I just want to print to the terminal. I don't want to return anything. I've named it print coordinate. Now let's think what input does the print coordinate function require? Well, it's going to need a struct coordinate and we can just call it, for example, a coord. Okay. Well, I can't spell. That's the problem there. Um, so it's going to go ahead and say the type of the parameter that's passed in is coordinate and the variable name is going to be coord. Okay, how do we print a coordinate? Well, we know how to do that. Why don't we just cut this out, paste it here, and rather it being point.x and point.y, it's going to be coord.x and coord.y. So no matter what coordinate is passed in, we know how to print it out to the terminal. Then down here, what do we do? We just call that procedure, call that function, print coordinate, and I'm going to pass in what? I'm going to pass in my coordinate, which is called point. The really cool thing is that I can reuse that wherever I want. Let's run this again, just to make sure it's doing the same thing. And you can see we get the same output as we did the first time. So that's how we can create structs, pass them around to functions, access the fields and all of that. All right. We also introduced recently the topic of arrays. So arrays are really cool. Arrays allow us to create a data structure or a variable that can store multiples of data. What does that mean? Well, structs allow us to store different fields related to a specific um, you know, object or something like that. Arrays allow us just to say, hey, I want to store 50 integers, 30 doubles, of, you know, something like that. And that term is homogeneous. So homogeneous means we can only store the same data type. So let's take a look at an arrays data a recap program. All right, same idea. I'm not gonna go over standard IO or main.h. What are we doing here? Let's take a look. Here we're creating an array of integers and I want to store five of them. That's simple. Whatever the value is here is the length of the array. And similar to structs, we have this syntax here where we can say, okay, well, I want to, I want my five integers to be the integers one, two, three, four, and five. So I can specify the starting values of my array really handy. All right. Let's say we want to print out just the fourth element of our array. Well, let's take a look at our int here. The fourth element will be that's one, two, three, four. So it should be the integer four. That's really easy to keep track of, but What's going on here, Jake? I'm printing index three. Well, that's because arrays are zero based. So this is index zero. This is index one, two, three. So that's index three matching up there. So it can catch people off. We mentioned this in the lecture, but don't, don't uh, make an off by one error. So, and we use these square braces once we have our array to access the index. So just a reminder, 0, 1, 2, 3 is going to print out 4. What well, should print out 4? We'll see what happens when we run it. All right, well, what if we want to change the fourth element? We just do the same thing. We use the index lookup notation just like this, and we can change the value with an assignment statement. Remember, don't be off by one. It's really common. All right, we can print it out again just to verify that it changed. 
And what if we want to print the entire array out to the terminal? Well, we just use a loop. We start the loop index at zero, loop five times, and we use our index variable uh, to access our arrays. So if I run this program, DCC arrays recap dash o to program, no errors, that's nice. Uh, let's run that. And I get, okay, let's have a look at this breakdown. Well, first it's printing the fourth element, which is four, that's fantastic. Then it's changing the fourth element to be 10, printing that out again, that's looking good. Then we print out, right, each element in the array, one, two, three, 10, because we changed it, right, five, and we're done. So arrays are awesome. In one number, I can change that to be 50, and I can sort 50 integers. Really, really nice, okay. So that's just a recap. Well, the question is, can we have an array of structs? Constructs and arrays be friends? And the answer um, is yes, how exciting. So really simply, we change the type of the array to be the struct, right? And then we get an array of structs and we use a combination of our index, well, of our index notation, right? From our arrays and the dot notation from our structs to access each element. And it really sort of just works the way you would expect. So um, I've just noticed this program is missing standardio.h. So we always want that. All right, here's the exact same struct coordinate um, from before. I'm just gonna change these to be percent %d. Don't know why they were percent %i. So we create our struct coordinate, right? That's exactly the same as the one that we had in our program before. We have our main function and I say, all right, let's look at this closely. I want an array of coordinates. Okay, I want an array of coordinates. So I'm gonna say, what's the type? What am I storing? I'm storing coordinates, struct coordinate. Just the way we ask to store a particular struct, we ask to store an array of structs. We give that thing a name. In this program, we're calling it points. How many points do I want? Five structs and arrays. And I can actually use the same initialization um, syntax. Let's break this down. Well, what's the first array element going to be? It's going to be a coordinate with one and two. What's the second one going to be? Three and four. You get the idea. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. All right. And we have got some code here that um, uses, accesses, overrides, um, these structs. So how do we print out the fourth element again? Well, our variable is called points. I want to access the fourth element. So that's index three. That, whoops, that will return to me back a struct. Let's think about it because the struct, right? That's the array. And what's it storing? The whole struct. If I've got a struct, how do I access one of the fields? I say dot x in this case, dot y, because that's x and that's y. Right? No new ideas here. We're just using the syntax of both together. What if I want to change one of the elements? Exactly the same thing you'd expect. Nothing different. What if I want to print all of the elements? Same thing. We loop five times and we print points, the ith point, the x value or the y value. All right, let's compile this. This is array, whoops, arrays of structs.c. Great. Let's run it. Um, now there's a bunch of numbers coming out, but that's all looking pretty good to me. Alrighty. One more thing I wanted to talk about that you need for the assignment one, and that is scanning in from the user a variable amount of times. Okay, what does that mean? Well, sometimes you want to you want to read some data in from the user and you might say, I want seven integers from you. Okay, well, that's easy to do. We loop seven times, ask for an integer, happy. Well, what if I want the user to tell me, right, um, how many pieces of information they want to give me? How can we do that? Well, it's actually not too hard. Uh, 
Here's how it's going to work. Well, the first thing, we're going to read an integer from the, from the user. So we just need to have an integer where we're going to store that value. So I'm going to say int uh, user input. All right, some variable that's going to represent the um, where the user's input is going to be stored. Okay. Then I'm going to make another integer called, in this case, result, and I'm going to assign it the result of calling scanf um, percent %d because we're scanning in an integer, and we're going to scan it into user input. So let's break this down. We're reading an integer from the user and assigning it to user input. So we're reading some data, reading an int into user input. All right, simple. But what's going on here? Well, scanf is a function that returns, now not the value that was typed in by the user, um, but it returns some information about the data that was read in. In this case, it returns in if, if, if it read something in. So did it read something in? One is yes, zero is no, whoops. Which means if the user typed in a valid integer, it's gotta be valid. Let's actually add that. It's gotta be valid. If the user typed something valid in, this is gonna say, hey, yeah, I've got something. I've got something to keep going. If they didn't type something valid in, or they hit something like control D, which means I've got nothing to give, that's also gonna get back a zero. So what that means we can say is while result is equal to one, so while we've got some data coming in, printf, um, let's just say red percent, whoops, percent D uh, from user input. And then what we're gonna do is say, I want you to check again in fact, I can just copy it if the user wants to type something else in. And what this allows us to basically do is loop while the user is entering data. That's really powerful. Let's run this to see what it does. DCC, variable scanning, dash out to program. See if I made any typos. It looks pretty good. Run that. Now, I didn't have a prompt here, right? So that's okay. But... Let's say I enter the integer five. What's that going to do? Well, it read the value five. What if I enter four? It read the value four, seven. It read the value, and it's going to go, it's going to keep doing this, right? Now this formatting isn't very nice, right? But we can, that's easy for you to fix up. What if I hit control D because I didn't enter any data? Well, the loop's going to end. Um, just as a quick note, that's, different from control C, which just quits the program. That's slightly different. Control C just says, hey, quit this program. Control D says, no, I'm not entering anything valid. That means this will return fal uh, false, right? And the program will end. So these are three, you know, two recaps, arrays of structs and variable scanning, some really important stuff that's going to help you with assignment one. I hope this was useful. Um, good luck with assignment one. Please make sure if you're watching this, that you watch the live stream. If you've watched the live stream, well, you won't, you'll be watching the live stream. But anyway, make sure you watch both the videos. They're, di they're doing different things. Um, and I will see you in the lecture in just a couple days. See ya.